Hello friends, today I would like to talk to you about the poem The Windover written by Gerard Manley Hopkins. The poem also has uh, a subtitle To Christ Our Lord. Now, I am not going into too many details about Gerard Manley Hopkins. He was a poet who lived in the Victorian period, but then he was not uh, he was kind of ignored at that time because his poetry was very, very different from the kind of poetry that his contemporaries wrote. It was only much later uh, that there was an interest in his poetry and uh, he was read along with uh, T.S. Eliot and Pound. And so many people tend to think that he is a modern poet, though he is Victorian. Now, I had done an earlier video on uh, Gerard Manley Hopkins and his uh, concepts of inscape and in stress. So now I am going uh, right to the poem The Windower. And let me uh, take an anticipatory bail here because uh, I, I, when I was preparing for the class, I came across this statement uh, which says, Critics who agree in praising the Windover's excellence cannot agree on its meaning. There are so many uh, interpretations of this poem and the words that he has used. And so all that I can assure you is that I will be giving you an interpretation which I find plausible. So let's begin. Now this poem, The Windover. Uh, and Gerard Manley Hopkins uh, himself said that this poem is the best thing I ever wrote and when he wrote the poem at first this dedication to Christ our Lord was not there it was simply titled the window but he waited for some time and after six years he still felt that this was the best thing he ever wrote and then he added the dedication to Christ our Lord because he was a great worshipper of Lord of the Lord and when you offer something to the Lord you would offer something that is the best when you choose flowers or fruits to be offered at the temple or the church you would always choose the best ones so same way here he waited for six years and then decided that this is the best thing he wrote and then he dedicated it to God and Hopkins's poetry is intensely religious it is also you can call his poetry as nature poetry because he talks about nature he talks about birds and beautiful sceneries and flowers and uh, fields so it is steeped in images from nature but then what is special about nature about uh, Hopkins is that now Hopkins was a priest and uh, uh, he saw the hands of God in everything in nature wherever he looked he saw the manifestations of God and in this poem too though the poem is titled the wind over the wind over is the name of a bird a bird a kestrel which is it is a predatory bird like an eagle but it is smaller in size than the eagle and it has the capacity to hover in the high skies that is why it is called the wind over this poem is a sonnet and uh, so as you know a sonnet has 14 lines and this one the first eight lines is called an octave or an octet the next six lines form the sestet and here the sestet itself is divided into two tercets three lines each two tercets so that is the structure of this poem now the rhyme scheme of the poem is a b b a a b b a c d c d c d in the octave the poet is watching a bird flying he's awestruck at its aerial acrobatics so he describes 
the bird and the beauty of its flight. In the sestet, he again talks about the bird and then the flight of the bird, it reminds him of Jesus Christ. So that's how the poem goes. So let me read the poem first. And uh, something that is special about Hopkins's poetry is that they are meant to be read aloud. Aloud, A-L-O-U-D. Hopkins took so much effort to make the poem sound as it does because he paid so much attention to the words that he chose, to the, to the uh, manner in which he arranged the words, to the meaning that he wanted to convey. And sometimes when he could not find words to suit his pattern, he would even coin new words. So that was the kind of uh, attention that uh, Hopkins paid to his poems, to the sound of his poems. And therefore, a true lover of uh, Hopkins's poetry should read his poem loud and not just once but over and over again. And when I read this poem, I somehow feel that I am not able to, uh, to capture or to bring out uh, the, the true feeling in the poem because there is so much of ardour, there is so much of passion that has gone into the writing of this poem. So uh, let me see whether I can uh, find a good audio of uh, this poem and if I do, I will definitely put it in the description box for you to listen to it. Now, for now, we will have to make do with my own uh, reading of the poem. So let's go on. The window. To Christ our Lord. I caught this morning, morning's minion, kingdom of daylight's dauphin, dapple dawn drawn falcon in his riding of the rolling level underneath him, steady air. And striding high there, how he rung upon the rein of a wimpling wing in his ecstasy, then off, off, forth on swing, as his skate's heel sweeps smooth on a bow bent. The hurl and gliding rebuffed the big wind. My heart in hiding stirred for a bird, the achiever of the mastery of the thing. Brute beauty and valor and act, O oh, air, pride, plume, here buckle. And the fire that breaks from thee then, a billion times told lovelier, more dangerous, O oh, my chevalier. No wonder of it. Sheer plod makes plough down cillian, shine and blue bleak embers are ah, my dear, fall gall themselves and gash gold vermilion. So that's the poem and let us uh, attempt to interpret this apparently complex poem. So he begins with the line, I caught this morning, morning's minion. He, what does he mean here by caught? He says that I caught a glimpse of, I happened to see early this morning, morning's minion. Minion, the word minion uh, means a favorite or uh, a servant and so here you can see uh, that the poet is telling us that he happened to catch a glimpse of morning's favorite that is this bird the kestrel the window is often seen uh, at dawn you would see it soaring high in the sky enjoying the cool uh, breeze of the morning and so that is what he tells us here I caught this morning morning's minion the darling of the morning kingdom of daylight stuffing 
so you can see the word king them is break is broken into two pieces he puts king there in the first line and he takes only dumb to the second line with a purpose because he wants all the d's there in that line so you have the dumb of daylight stuff in dapple dawn drawn so it must be a deliberate move on the part of hopkins and you can see that now here the bird is addressed as the kingdom of daylight's dauphin dauphin is a prince so here in this first few lines you can see the imagery of a royal court it is in the court that you have minions uh, favorites and this bird is the favorite of the morning sky and he is the prince the dauphin of kingdom of daylight and he is seen to be riding in the dapple dawn drawn falcon he is described as the dapple dawn drawn falcon now dawn of course you know what it is it is the early morning and dapple here is the word which describes the dawn the sky of the dawn which is dappled or spotted it is spotted with various hues and colors uh, because we know that in the morning the sky is uh, uh, very colorful you have pink and golden and yellow and orange and blue and purple so all these shades so the dawn that is dappled or uh, spotted with colors and this bird because he loves to fly in the morning he has been drawn from his sleep or from his perch early morning that is why dapple dawn drawn falcon so here in the first line we saw that there are a lot of m's morning morning's minion so this is uh, a play of alliteration then again here in the second line you have dumb of daylight stuff in dapple dawn drawn so or, or in all those words you have the d a repetition of the d which which gives a kind of a roar or a or a, a force to this entire line in his riding of the rolling level underneath him steady air and what did he see the bird doing he saw the bird riding on the rolling level riding off the level. just like a, a prince rides his horse here this prince that is this bird is riding the sky of the riding of the rolling level now what is the rolling level the rolling unending limitless sky underneath him steady air so he is holding his wings steady and he is gliding over the sky or beneath the sky in the sky and striding high there how he rung upon the rain of a wimpling wing in his ecstasy and the bird is ecstatic because it is doing something that it loves to do and what is it that it loves to do it loves to fly and so he is flying and he is soaring into the sky high there how he rung upon the rain of a wimpling wing so oh, this word ring rung is the past tense of ring and in falconry or in the training of falcons the word ring means to uh, training the falcon to move upward in widening circles so the bird is trained to move upward in circles it moves up 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 like that and in horse training the very same word ring has another meaning the trainer stands in the in at in a spot with the rain rain r e i n rain you know the rain of the horse with the rain in his hand 
and uh, one end of the rein he holds in his hand and the horse is trained to slowly walk around him in a ring. It has to move in circles, go round and round uh, and the trainer would be standing in the middle. So that is ringing in horse training. And so here uh, this bird, it is uh, moving upward in the early morning fresh beautiful sky and uh, it, it is moving on its wimpling wing. Now wimple you know is the, is the front portion of uh, a nun's head dress. You have the uh, cloth the cloth that a nun wears on her head and the front part the folded part here is called the wim wimple and here wimpling also has the meaning of pleated now uh, i think i am not able to establish the connection between the wimple of a nun and this particular context but it is easier for me to understand when i say that wimpling is folded or pleated because when you look at the uh, picture of a kestrel with its wings spread wide open the feathers seem to be arranged in a pleated style as the one is kept laid very neatly on another. So I would like to believe that wimpling wing refers to the pleated wing of this bird. And so the bird is kind of rising into the sky on its wimpling wing and he seems to be holding. Now again, when you watch videos of uh, a kestrel or an eagle or a falcon uh, ringing or rising up or hovering in the sky, you see that its beak is kind of centered at a certain point and it seems to be balancing in the wind without moving. You know what hovering means? Standing steadily in one particular I mean standing steadily in the air with nothing to support you other than the air. You know that helicopters can hover. Uh, they can just remain in one place without moving either front, forwards or backwards or sideways. They can just remain static in one place. And so here when you watch the bird uh, hovering, you can see that it seems to be pointing its beak a little downward. It's tilted a little downward. Maybe there is this uh, centrifugal force and such things uh, in aerodynamics which kind of it may be uh, trying to balance itself and so how he rung upon the rein of a wimpling wing. So it is as if he is uh, in this act of balancing and trying to hover. He seems to hold the rein of the entire sky in his beak. And uh, hi there, how he rung upon the rain of the wimpling wing in his ecstasy. So he's ecstatic and he's enjoying what he's doing. Then off, off, forth on swing as his skates heel sweeps smooth on a bow bend. And so suddenly, this bird, with uh, no warning whatsoever, suddenly springs away. It swings forward, it moves away as his skates heel. Now, here, when you watch a person skating, that is an expert skater, not a novice, an expert skater, when he skates on a surface and when he comes to a, a slight race or a bump in the road, what does a skater do? He adjusts the skate in such a way and he just glides over, he just jumps over the bump and lands on the other side very smoothly. So similarly, this bird that had been hovering in the sky in great ecstasy, it suddenly swings forth as the skates heel sweeps smooth on a bow bend. You can see here again, there is a play of the sound S and again there is bow bend. And then the hurl and the gliding rebuffed the big wind. So the way the bird hurled itself and glided forward, even the big wind was not able to rebuff the bird. So he was able to conquer the wind. And 
the poet is watching this sight in great awe so that's why my heart in hiding stirred for a bird so now he says my heart in hiding and i once again repeat the line that i read about this poem critics who agree in praising the window of his excellence cannot agree on its meaning so here i wonder what he means by saying my heart in hiding so maybe he kind of was keeping his heart in seclusion maybe being a priest maybe he had uh, been exercising strict control over his heart uh, training it not to be uh, overjoyed at anything it sees but whatever his heart had been in hiding but this heart was overwhelmed it was it stirred it was moved by the beauty of the flight of this bird and he was drawn out of his hiding by the achieve of the mastery of the thing he says he had not seen anything so skillful what mastery the bird has in its flight so when we think about the inscape of this poem you know the concept of inscape that um, hopkins uh, deals with in his poems according to him inscape is the essence it is the essential quality that defines an object or defines anything for that matter it is that unique quality that makes something what it is so here if you look for the inscape the inscape of this bird is the flight is its mastery over its flight its um, skill in flying that is the inscape of this particular bird and and what is the in stress i mean uh, what is the in stress here now what is in stress in stress is the uh, attempt of the poet to express the inscape there is some unique quality in everything and a poet through his poetry tries to experience that inscape or he tries to experience whatever this bird or this object is feeling or it tries to experience that essential quality and the poet tries to convey it to the reader so in stress is that process through which he tries to tell the reader about the inscape of an object and here that is exactly what hopkins is trying to do he is by using all these words in all these uh, unheard of patterns he is trying to make us feel the skill in the mastery and the beauty of the windover's flight and i think he uh, has um, succeeded to a great extent because don't you feel the force of the bird don't you feel the beauty of the bird when you read his words so that is the first stanza or the octave now let's go on to the sestet and let's take the first tercet brute beauty and valor and act o oh, air pride bloom here buckle and the fire that breaks from thee then a billion times told lovelier more dangerous o oh, my chevalier so he says that so many things come together in this bird brute beauty why is it brute because this is essentially a predatory bird it is capable of killing and tearing open its prey so it is a brutish and so it's brute beauty and valor and act the act of flying and the air the sky the pride of the bird the plume and the feathers and the wings of the bird all this here buckle now how do you interpret this word buckle buckle has many meanings one buckle that we know of is the buckle uh, the clip that holds something together the buckle that you have on your bag so that you can close the bag and keep it together and again buckle can mean um, going weak in your knees you know surrendering to force Uh, i was very tired and my knees buckled and i just fell down 
okay that buckling losing strength giving um, giving oneself up to some kind of a force and again buckle up also has the opposite meaning of when you say that buckle up buckle up uh, in the sense uh, now get ready gather strength so that way also you can look at buckle so here i think one way is one we can look at it is he says that in this one bird everything is buckled together it's all clubbed together what is clubbed together brute beauty valor act air pride blue all this together are buckled into this one beautiful creature the wind over and the fire that breaks from thee then a billion times to lovelier more dangerous oh my chevalier and um he says that when this bird and okay again another meaning can be that this bird from this elevated position where it is now hovering suddenly swoops down swoops down it buckles buckle is coming down so it swoops down and because uh, the wind over can uh, see it's got a very sharp eyesight and it can see a prey which is kilometers away from it and so it may be sees something and it swoops down and it like an arrow like a fiery arrow because here there is a reference a reference to fire maybe when the bird turns and swoops down the dawn the sunlight of the dawn reflects on this bird in uh, a yellowish kind of a color and it looks like an arrow of fire is darting down so that can also be one way to interpret this and another thing that happens now is that as he is watching the bird the magnificent bird he is suddenly reminded of christ himself because as i mentioned earlier hopkins was intensely spiritual and when he saw something in nature he was immediately reminded of the creator when he saw a bird he admired the beauty of the bird the flight of the bird and the next thing that would come to his mind is the creator how great if the bird is so beautiful if the bird is so magnificent how much more magnificent would be the one who created him when he sees um um a powerful um, i mean when he sees a huge cliff what comes to his mind is oh god if you can create this immensely large mountain then how much more powerful would you be so here as he watches this bird we already said that uh, he already told us that his heart in hiding has been drawn out and now he is overwhelmed by the passions that he feels for uh, for god the creator and the fire might also symbolize christ and the buckling again might be a reference to christ who buckled down who came down from his heavenly abode he allowed himself to be taken down to this earth and he allowed himself to be subjected to the sufferings of the human world so it is a buckling it is the fall of christ from his heavenly abode and it is christ who he pictures here as fire that breaks from the then a billion times told lovelier more dangerous oh my chevalier chevalier is a warrior a soldier so he sees this bird as a representative as a symbol of christ himself and then coming to the last tercet no wonder of it sheer plod makes plow down silly and shine and blue bleak embers are my dear fall gall themselves and gash gold vermilion no wonder of it only um Uh, gm hopkins can write poetry like this so anyway so what he says is that there is no wonder it has to be god nothing else can be so beautiful and so powerful and then he says 
sheer plod makes plow down silly and shine so plod here is hard work it can be hard work sheer plod is intense hard work so here you have the image of a field where a, a farmer or a peasant is plowing the soil he's working hard he's plowing the soil and he is digging furrows into the soil and the soil that is upturned it is moist because it has been lying uh, underneath and now he kind of overturns it with his plow and this wet plowed up soil is what is called a cilian and this cilian is shining because it's moist because it's got maybe uh, some particles now in, in sand and in soil you know that there are some shiny particles so the moisture and the mix of these shiny particles make it glow make it shine or it also can be interpreted so either it is this cilian the wet moist mud that is plowed up either it is that and especially when the dawn light falls on it maybe that is what makes it shine because you know that uh, moisture or water has this quality of shining when light falls on it or he can also be saying that it is the plow that is shining uh, because the plow through hard work it has become very sharp and when you want to cut something you take a knife and if you find that it's blunt what you do you rub it hard against a stone so that you kind of polish it and when you uh, polish it on the stone you rub it against the stone because the edge uh, through that harsh friction the the edge becomes sharp and you can see that it will shine when it becomes sharp and same way here the plod through its sheer hard work its edge uh, attains a kind of a sheen or a shiny appearance so it is through hard work that you can shine or excel yourself it is through suffering through intense suffering that Jesus was able to finally reveal his brilliance that Jesus revealed that he was a great blessing to God to man and then he goes on to another image of blue bleak embers now what is an ember an ember is a piece of burning coal which is covered with ash there is fire inside but outwardly it looks dull it's just blue and bleak it's not bright because the color of uh, ashes you know it is grayish so that is why blue bleak embers ah my dear by now the poet too is ecstatic he is ecstatic because he is writing poetry he is glorifying god through his poetry and so he says he is overwhelmed by his feelings of devotion to god and he says when blue bleak embers fall gall themselves fall it falls down gall gall is when it hurts itself what happens to the ember so when a piece of ember a burning coal covered with ash when it falls down when you throw it down on to the floor what happens to it it breaks open there is a gash it falls it gall themselves means they wound themselves they are hurt and they burst open and when an ember breaks open gash is a wound as you would say uh, blood gushed out through the gash okay so gash is a wound and so um, a cut so when this uh, ember breaks open what do you see inside you see the gold vermilion so here when now this is exactly the uh, the the process through which Christ went through his father the God Almighty threw him down to the earth he fell 
he hurt himself he suffered he went through unbearable torture of the mind and the body and he was hurt he was wounded he was put up on the cross his body was pierced a soldier struck his spear right through the side of Christ's body and it is through these wounds that Christ revealed his brilliance it is after going through after subjective subjecting himself to so much suffering so much of pain that Christ revealed his brilliance to the world it is his suffering that drew him close to the heart of God his father and it is this very suffering the sacrifice that drew him close to the hearts of billions of people so without this suffering the mission that he was sent to accomplish would not have been completed and so here uh, Hopkins is paying a wonderfully and overwhelmingly beautiful and passionate tribute to God his creator he is expressing his awe and admiration to God for his creation and for his suffering for the sacrifice that he underwent in order to to save mankind so the inscape in this poem the inscape of this bird at least as I mentioned earlier is its skill its mastery in its flight and the poem is an attempt to express the instress of this bird's flight and I think to a very large extent Hopkins has succeeded in what he intended to do because he is able to take us along with the bird in its soaring exercise and he is also uh, able to make us feel the pain of Christ's suffering so it is the most beautiful tribute that a servant of God an admirer of God can pay to him that is all I can say about this poem The Windover by Gerard Manley Hopkins